So originally our plan for today was to kind of like go through some stuff on batteries and MOSFETs in the sense of how batteries work and how power systems work in more detail and then how to select MOSFETs and stuff like that. Um, but we think that like we've talked a lot about power systems over the past uh, few weeks because that's our main area of expertise, so you've probably gotten a lot of that, and we will throw links on the website for those of you who are interested in like batteries, MOSFETs, power sourcing, if that helps anyone's project. Um, but we looked at um, the layouts on uh, Altium 365, and I think people are struggling a little bit to get um, layout, um, like the intuition behind layout. So I think, um, we first we extended the deadline to Tuesday, so mm -hmm. if you don't know that layout is now due Tuesday before lab, we will design review you in lab sections. We're not going to design review you. Well, we didn't design review yesterday, so it's due Tuesday. Yep. Um, and then we're going to take to kind of I'm going to do a little bit of a something on the board to start for like 10, 15 minutes to make a point. Um, but then after that, think of today kind of like. We're gonna ask two main questions. Number one, like, what is something you wish you learned in this class that we haven't taught you? And what is something you wish you learned in other classes that they haven't taught you? And if you have questions on electrical design, um, PCB stuff, layout, application, you wanna show cool videos, you wanna know where Fisher got his amazing shirt. Um, we're just gonna do all that on the board. Um, but before yeah. we get there, I have a couple things I wanna say, unless you wanna say anything. Um, yeah, all, the purpose of today is like some combination of, um, we, we were looking through layout and we think that there's something missing, um, just between like all the stuff that we've gone over in lecture with the class content, and um, we're kind of noticing that there's like, all right, we gave you some math, we gave you some practical skills. We think that there's like some intuition in the middle that we want to build, and we want to um, get your input on where you currently are in. Oh no, um, we want to get your input on like what that kind of intuition looks like to y'all, um, because it's something that we've accrued over many many years of building these kinds of systems. Um, and trying to figure out how to package that and how to distill it down into something that can be taught over a month is um, difficult and it's something we need your input on. This is the first time we're running this and we um, told you at the beginning it was a big experiment. So we're gonna, um, today's format's gonna reflect that a lot. Um, so the purpose of today is to like get a poll of like where your headspace is and um, incorporate that into, um, into what we're trying to do here and then also just be a chance for y'all to pick our brains. Like if there's anything that you want to know about literally whatever, um, we want to be here and available for you because next week things are going to pick up a little bit. Um, we're going to be finishing up the speakers, going to be doing um, like some design reviews, grading, a bunch of logistical stuff. And so like right now is like um, a nice like pause right before all of that happens. So we want to make ourselves available and figure out where you all are at. Does that hopefully seem like a reasonable thing to do? Cool. Um, with that, I will let you take it away. Um, so I think, um, I just want to spend a couple minutes at the beginning of lecture before we just open up to you talking about um, why this class is called what it's called. Um, as you know, the class is called the art and science of PCB design, not just PCB design or not just electrical systems or something like that. Um, we put a large emphasis on putting, making the word art appear in the name of the art and science of PCB design. Um, and I think that's because, at least to me, where great engineering lies is both at the intersection of science and art. And I think you don't get a lot of that at MIT. I think at MIT, you sit here and you're like, why don't we overanalyze this capacitor for 45 hours and then read a data sheet and pick one? You know? And then there's this whole side of engineering, which is like, like, I think what excites us about engineering, right, is like science and art, or sorry, science and engineering, you use this to fulfill your like, You, you use math, you use engineering to fulfill your functional requirements, right? Like you have things you need your design to do. And math informs that design. Engineering, physics, all this stuff informs design in that sense, right? Like it makes you convince yourself 
uh, that like your system is going to work and it's going to work every time and like there's other methods we use and that's that's like the engineering part right but I if I may I think what gets us excited about doing engineering and and science is the art that like goes into it right this is like I don't know this is what gets us excited so for me personally, one of the reasons I really wanted to do engineering was uh, both looking at like NASA rovers when they landed on the red planet, and then also like I'm a big Apple fan, but I'm gonna tell you why I'm a big Apple fan. Um, and the reason I'm such a large fan of all of Apple's products, and it's a large inspiration to everything I think I have done as an engineer, is because Apple is very good at doing two things. Number one, they build really, really, really robust products. Like, there is so much detailed consideration, engineering, math, design that goes into building an Apple product. So that's over here, right? It works. Um, it just, like, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, for those of you Windows users who turn on your computer every time you go through 65 different sub-menus, to get to the thing you want to get to, or the fact that it updates every three hours, right? It's just not as consistent as an Apple product. You can have your like, you can have your takes on like which has been better, Apple's or Windows, and that's fine, right? But in terms of consistent user experience, not many things beat an Apple product. And that side is almost the art side, right? That's not really the engineering side. That's not the design side. There's no math that can tell you this button should do this thing every time. There's no, like Fisher and I had a whole conversation the other day about how we love the fact that when you hit the caps lock button on a, a MacBook and you hit the shift key, it stays caps locked. Whereas on Windows, if you hit caps lock and you hit shift, it like, un, it like inverts your shift or something. We're, like we love that kind of, that feat. Like, I mean, that's your personal preference whether you like that or not. But like, it comes to, Somebody sat there and thought for a very long time about how can I make somebody love this product? How can I make them love using it, right? And that's like, and that's the art side of engineering. That's not, that has nothing to do with, like nobody sat there and quantified how long you should hold down the caps lock key. Like nobody cares. Um, and then the art informs the science and the engineering, right? What you want to do here, how pretty you want to make your thing, informs what you do here. It creates some functional requirements for you, especially in the case of Apple. Or like if you look at the Mars rovers that, that land on Mars, like they just look awesome, right? Like you look at them and you're like, that's aw Like you didn't get excited because it uses a radioisotope to heat, like when you were six years old, right? You didn't get excited that it uses a plutonium radioisotope to decay, to heat the system while it's whatever. You got excited because it just looks freaking awesome, right? right? There's like these two sides, like engineering combines science, like engineering is kind of the bridge, right, between science and math and art. So my argument here is that like, I want you guys, when you're designing systems, where your passion gets shown is both in the side of like, how well did I analyze the system to make it work, but also just how pretty is it when it comes out, right? So if you just throw a whole bunch of components on a PCB, it could be the best routed PCB in the world electrically, but if it doesn't look beautiful, you're not gonna feel excited about it, we're not gonna feel excited about it as a product design, right? Like, aesthetics, I think, is not valued as much as it needs to be in teaching engineering, because like, that's what gets us excited about the product, right? Like, it's not excited, like, we're excited because it's beautiful. And when it's beautiful, you assume it's well engineered. And what we want to try to get you to think about is how do you make it beautiful and well engineered? Because there's many companies that focus on the beautiful. There's many companies that focus on the well engineered, but there's not a lot of people who can do both well. And I think that's where truly excellent engineering sits. And that's why Apple is one of my favorite companies, or like even NASA, they like their, their stuff is beautiful and it works. Um, so that's just a little like, when you're laying out your PCB, if you're really struggling about where to put components, part of me thinks 
something we've been doing, like, because we've been discussing the entire class of, like, oh, put your bypass capacitor here, this is the value, like, get this trace as short as possible and stuff like that. Yes, think about those kind of things, right? But if you're struggling to do that, just start by putting components, start by grouping components that are, like, supposed to be together together, obviously. But then after that, think about how can I arrange this so it looks pretty? And that's not, I think, I feel like a lot of the time we sit here in classrooms and we teach you guys, like, it's not valid to do things because it's pretty. That's bad. Do math. Analyze it to hell and then, there goes my chop. Analyze it to hell and then you'll get the answer, right? But sometimes math can't tell you the answer. And I think we should stop pretending that math will always give you an answer. So, like, do what feels right, do what looks good, and if it's a problem, that's what design reads for. That's what somebody who has more experience in design will come in and tell you, don't put your ground trace there, it'll explode, right? Like, and tangentially to this a little bit, and we'll talk about this a little bit more on Monday, I think when we, when we get into like our final lecture, but like, there is no harm in trying things. Like, the way I learned engineering, the way Fisher learned engineering is by almost blowing ourselves up a couple times. I was in my basement once, I used uh, three, uh, like 22 gauge copper wire and I ran 40 amps of current through it. And if anybody knows anything about wire gauges, 22 gauge copper wire does not carry 40 amps of current, it carries four, roughly. And I, and I poured smoke into the entirety of my basement, I walked up, my mother's cooking, and she just sees smoke pouring out of the basement and me coughing coming up the stairs. And then I learned to Google wire gauges, right? Like, be safe as much as you can, but it's okay to learn from failure. I feel like we sit here in class and we're like, math will always give you the answer. Math will always tell you what you should do every single time, and it won't. Sometimes you have to build intuition by failing, and it's okay to fail. Um, the last thing I will leave you with before we get into like what your guys' questions are, right? It's like, over here, I think is what we've been teaching in lecture a lot in terms of math. Like what, uh, this is, I define, this is kind of how I define engineering a little bit. Over here you have the math, which is like, I have a capacitor, how big does it need to be? What equations can like tell me how big my components need to be? How thick does my beam need to be if, it's, if I'm bending a beam? How, like, how large does my battery need to be? Or all that kind of stuff. And that's where math switch, it informs your design. And then over here is the practical. Um, I think another issue sometimes in lecture, what we do is we, we, like, we do math on the board, but like at the end of the day, sometimes we forget that we're engineers and our job is to build something in like the real world, right? So like knowing how to build something in the real world, I argue is more important than what the math is telling you to do. Because no matter what math you do, if you can't build what you've designed, what does it matter? So over here is the practical, and this is what we're trying to teach you in lab, soldering, uh, debugging, PCBs, and all that kind of stuff, right? And then there's this block in the middle here, which I like to call intuition. Um, which I think is the bridge between the theoretical and the practical, to some extent, right? Like, intuition comes from us trying things. That informs our design. Our design informs us trying things. Like, once, you've get, once you have enough design experience, like people who've taken, I don't know, course twos, you've taken 2001, you know that um, the stiffness of a beam in bending goes by the thickness squared. But you don't need to always calculate, right? Like sometimes you sit there and you're about to build something and you have two sticks in front of you and one is thicker than the other and now you know you should use the thicker stick because that stick is in bending because you did math like three months ago that tells you this, right? But you didn't calculate that, you just made that connection in your head. That's intuition. And it goes, it goes both ways. Um, and I think labs focus a lot on this Lectures focus a lot on this, but there's, it's very difficult to teach this. Because like, this comes from years and years and years of trying things and breaking things and like, not being afraid to fail, I think. So, I guess our question to you today is how do we help you guys build this? 
and the rest of the lecture time is going to be what components are you missing from here and here to help you fill in this bridge? Because this, I think, I think there's a lot of people who say you can't engineer with intuition. And I think that's true in the sense that you can't engineer with just intuition. You need the practical, you need the, you need the practical, you need the theoretical, right? But that doesn't make intuition not important to engineering. The most, the best engineers that I know sit right here. They have very strong intuition about what is happening in the real world and in the theoretical world. So we're gonna try to help you build this. Um, so we're gonna open up to you. What do you want to know? Or how can we help you build that? writing them down so we can kind of like address them as we go. I was the biggest thing is like we don't know how it works. So it's like hard to run into a place that works. And that's not necessarily like any form of course. It's just like bring up keys. Given the constraints of the class, like it's over IAP and there are limited resources, it was, well, there was very little room for failure. Like in lab, one day I dropped a single LED and then I was told I wouldn't be able to finish populating the board. Um, and also like for layout, if you messed up, then you'd have to like basically restart and that would take like a bunch of hours, like up to 10 probably. fast. Those are the two 
addict, at least with me, I spent a lot of time just copying things, mm -hmm. whereas if I had to show, figure out exactly what I needed to do for something that was simpler, I think I would have learned a little bit more of the process. So more design. This first one, the jump between LEDs and speakers, was something actually all three of our LEDs also brought up, and we agree with. <laughs> um, so I'm curious to know your guys' thoughts on because I think a couple of things we could have done, right? Is either you push this class to be a longer class, like in the semester, and you do small project, medium project, and then work your way up to Bluetooth speaker. Or you have just an IP class with a smaller project, but for us, we were, we kind of struggled to figure out, maybe because we've been in electrical design for a very long time, what a simpler project would look like. Because our the thing we liked with the, uh, the Bluetooth speaker is you have the ESP32 and all the digital circuitry around that. You have the speaker itself and all the analog circuitry around that, and then you have the battery and all the power circuitry around that. So you have these three, like the three cruxes of electrical design on one board. But maybe that's not needed if, like what you were saying is we're not actually doing the design work, if we're just doing layout. So I'm curious what else, and we also thought Bluetooth speaker would be exciting. So what other things would you guys be excited about? Like if we took off the Bluetooth component, or if we took off the power component, would that be still as exciting? Or like, where do you draw the line of like, this is so simple, it's no longer exciting? Does anybody have ideas on like, what would you, what do you want to build? give you much in the rest of the project. So if we threw out lab one, and we started lab one with like, here's the stuff we designed, here's what you should design, we made lab one, lab two, like week one, like design kind of stuff. And then the first time you saw Altium was with the Bluetooth speaker. That might be intimidating, but was that still okay? Uh, I guess like, um, and other people can jump in, but you could also potentially do it as a pre-lab, right? Because you guys did a lot of sort of um, 
I guess, pub or publicizing this class. So you could be like, oh, here's like a small tutorial for people who have done Alchem before. You don't have to do this. Oh, yeah, make lab so for one people who have it, this might be a good like starting point to do on your own. And then we can start with lab one doing this. Like, where's the Bluetooth speaker? Okay. speaker works or the one that Fisher did like Wednesday Wednesday okay do that earlier yeah uh, yeah whatever our lists are not organized anymore. Anyway. Let's say, let's say this class had like no constraints, right? On in terms of like, let's say, let's assume right now we could make it a semester class if we wanted to, we could make an IV class if we wanted to, whatever the and no kind of constraint. How much would you want a class like this to teach design? And how much would you want a class like this to just teach the practical? Because I think what we're here, what we're here doing is just teaching you you have circuit put on PCB and what are the considerations. But how much would you want? part of the class, because along with the whole USB stuff, right, there's like, I could teach you how to put a USB on the board, but I could also teach you about signal integrity and differential pairs and how to route communications and like all that kind of stuff. And how much would you want of that information as opposed to just putting it on the board? Like where, where do you draw the line on what is useful? Is that any question? Uh, anyone in the room, but if you have an answer. Um. Is there a hand over here earlier? Well, anything else anyone wants to build? It can be anything, no matter how simple or complex. Like, what is something that you were like, I saw this on the internet, that's awesome. something. You came to MIT. You didn't go to Harvard or Stanford or Caltech. You came here. So that means you like to build things. So yeah. There's actually somebody doing that as a practice project. So, yeah. And also I feel like it's the stage of learning, especially for me it's like I think it applies to both art and science, right? It doesn't matter if somebody's done it before, right? There's still value in you doing it. Because you learn a lot from what they've done. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like a more simplified like calculator? Um, like, a, like a pocket calculator yeah. kind of thing?
you should talk to TMRC. Go talk to Andre after lecture. For things like this, where we would start to have like microcontrollers in there and have like more firmware, more code, is that something that you would like to poke at? Is that something that we should include as part of the design intuition? Or is giving that to you like a priori as a black box that's it, right? Or do you think you learned too much coding here already? Yeah. I would say maybe not necessarily like all of the code, but for me personally, one of the roadblocks that I ran into in other projects was I didn't know exactly how to like set up the very basic tool stuff. Mm -hmm. Cause that's like usually done for us in other classes. So maybe that part. Like sure. tool chain. So would you be interested in, just to clarify where the line is for you, would you be interested in how Fisher set up the environment to flash the ESP, but not necessarily the code that went on yeah, the like ESP? Yeah, the code, we cover that in other classes. Right. Flash and stuff, no. Okay. So tool chain. Yeah. Interesting. Which is an interesting point because I feel yeah. like that's almost the harder part in yeah. certain cases. No, it is. It's, tool chain. it's also the thing that like we've struggled the most with, like in like our projects as well. Like the race, the tool chain for like compiling and uploading code for race car is built on like ten years of like terrible make files, and then like the program that like Addy's lab uses for like building code got like just deprecated. got deprecated. Yeah. So now like so and officially deprecated, which means we are now struggling to find another IDE that can do all the things we need yeah. to do. It's, it's non-trivial, so I'm glad you brought up that point. Cool. Seems legit. That's a good list. Yeah. So. When y'all were like signing up for the class and heard about it, um, what was it that got you interested in it? Like we um, we said like all right, we're gonna like do a project. Um, depending on when you heard about us, we might have decided on a Bluetooth speaker at that point. We might not have. How much does the novelty of the project like influence um, like what you're trying to do here? Like like the fact that you're built like if you're track one, you're building a Bluetooth speaker like. Um, we hope makes you excited, but that's not the reason you joined the class, right? Or is it? Yeah. <laughs> or if it is, like that's valid. Just tell us. Uh, I think it's it could, it's like really individual, but for me personally, as like a course ten, mm -hmm. we really build a lot of things. So mm -hmm. I was more interested in like just like the hands on aspect. I always really like So you didn't care what it was. Mm -hmm. huh? You didn't care what it was. Just I build something. If we were learning a CAD program like Eagle, which is not as industry standard but still somewhat useful, would you be as excited, or was it Altium and like an industry used CAD program that really made you excited, or was Eagle like okay? I feel like Eagle would be fine too, as long as there's like you know some like you transfer your skills like from one program to another. Like I think that's essential. So the program didn't matter that much. Mm -hmm. for the, yeah, I and mean, we're huge Altium fans, but. That's good to know. Cool. 
it's something you would buy or use in your daily life. Something like you actually want. So almost product yeah. device. Yeah. yeah. Back at things we build like a little analog synthesizer. Sure. That's another person's yeah. factory project. because this gets us dangerously close to 2009 for core 6 territory, which is exactly what I've been pushing for for years. discussion we had amongst the staff that we didn't actually come to a conclusion to, because there's like pros and cons either way, was since it's an IAP course, we were like, we shouldn't really have prereqs, because that doesn't seem fair. But on the one hand, if 6002 was a prereq for this class, or 2678 was a prereq for this class, maybe people would come in with a deeper understanding of how basic circuits work, and then maybe you could get more from the class. So. Do people have thoughts on that debate? Like, do people feel like, especially people who maybe didn't come in with 6702 or 2678, mm -hmm. do you think taking that should be a requirement? Do you think you still got something out of the class? Or, So one of, the, one of the things 212, which is a Mechi robotics class does, is their prereq is 2004, which is a controls class. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the semester, Professor Harry Asada has a like, it's like a three hour office hour lecture kind of thing that basically is just crash course in 2004, and now you can take the rest of the class. If we did week one of this class, we sat in this room for three hours and explained everything we possibly think we could about circuit components. Is that something you guys, I know it'd be a lot, but would you show up and would it be interesting and would that be useful? Yeah, but only after the motorcycle lecture. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Actually, on that lecture, the motorcycle lecture, the first lecture, because we staff has also gone back and forth on this lecture quite a bit, um, which is we thought that lecture was great in teaching you how to design something, but people like feedback was a little mixed in the sense that people were like, "It's great, we get what you were trying to do," but someone suggested maybe it's more useful if instead of designing like a large system like a bike, we like did that but for a PCB or like an electrical system. Now, if we had done that same kind of lecture but for a different system, would that have been useful or do people like the step back, look at a larger system that people kind of already have intuition on? Like in the sense like you all know how a car works. 
you already have intuition on that system, which is why we chose that system specifically. You didn't really need background knowledge going into designing, like I, it has to go, clearly. Um, or do you think for the rest of the class, would it have been more useful if we designed like a board? I think the motorcycle was good because like you said, we already had intuition on it and it was, it was a cool, like, cool thing to work on. Is there an example of that of a, a smaller system that comes to mind that you think would be like more manageable to take a look at? It's okay if you don't have an answer. I'm just curious. Okay, cool. If you have something. Yeah, personally, um, it was like good to see the experience in the motorcycle, but I think like the fact that it was like a large system was a little bit overwhelming at first glance. So maybe like related to like the step by step kind of thing, you can like go part one back to one part, second back to one part, like go. So it sounds like just a um, like a more like a deeper dive into each section a few times over, well paced out. Um, would you want to do like maybe layout in parallel with that? Like we talk about like um, so we talk about USB, the microcontroller, everything in lecture for a day, and then you go home and as your like homework is you route that part of the board, and then you do that over and over and over again. And by the time you get to layout, it's a series of like incremental things instead of just one big Herculean task. Does that sound a little more like approachable, somewhat more tractable? Okay, cool. Yeah, because I think you want to know like what, why you put which power on the board. Like, why do you decide? Yeah. Like, how do you know what the board is going on? Gotcha. Do you think, because I think we tried to do that with Fisher's lecture on how the Bluetooth speaker worked. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was too much too fast? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. I'm an LA, so I'm not really taking the class, but um, I do think, since I know a lot of people are confused about the Bluetooth speaker, and this is just me like spitballing here, but how many of you guys would like think it would be interesting if like, in addition to like the theoretical talks that, that Eddie and Fisher have planned and such, like let's say we had lectures still operating like that normally, like, let's say we tackle at the end of lecture one part of the Bluetooth speaker device and we explained it in detail. And that would be a bit easier for you to digest over time so that you guys have an idea about like, and it, it, it could also tie to what the lecture topic will yeah. be that day, but it can be uh, an easier way to step into it. Cool. Kind of sounds like the concept that like people are kind of converging on is like do one thing and do it well, yeah. but like space Deep it out. Deep dive in one thing. Yeah. Okay. Especially for a shorter course, maybe for a yeah. longer course we could have thinking, and if you have a, another plan, mm -hmm. we can talk about it, is there, I think this is all really good feedback, and we will definitely take into account when we build mm -hmm. the class for next year. Um, but in this list of things that people are kind of like, like what can we do with the rest of this time to help you guys? In the sense of like, are there any of these questions that you guys asked at the beginning of lecture that we can try to answer now? Or are there resources you want us to point point you to? Like, We're also, what, can, what can we do to help you? What would be useful? Because like, it's not like, all the way down to like, there's a transistor on the board and I don't know what it does. Yeah. Like, like we could take the rest of our time, like if we have 40 minutes or so, and basically do like any number of these things. Like, um, we can, talk about like some of how the speaker works, we could um, like 
talk about just our journeys through engineering if, and like how we started doing things. Um, happy to run through like what is a resistor, what is a capacitor, what's an inductor. Um, just like I have principles. silly explanations of components slide prepared somewhere. Yes. We were going to give that lecture, we just didn't have time. Yep. Um, we can also like design a smaller system like on a chalkboard, much like we did for lecture one. Um, what would you all like to see? Your story is probably cuter than mine is. What's my story? <laughs> like, you're, like, you're, you're like setting fires in the basement. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. I set a lot of fires to a lot of things. Um, oh, yeah. How did I get started? OK, so I got started, well, my, my interest in science and engineering is when my mom, when I was very young, read me. Instead of, she didn't read me. She did read me Curious George a little bit, but when I was old enough, instead of picking up like, I don't know, what, what do people's moms, I don't even know what people's moms read them, because like, my mom picked up National Geographic <laughs> and started reading me this as a bedtime story. Um, for context, my mom was an urban planner and also a geologist, to the point where like, she, like we went to Grand Canyon and she'll like pick out the strata of the rocks and she'll be like, this is the year that that rock was formed or something like she's a total science nerd. So she got me interested in science. Um, what got me interested in engineering is when my dad bought me a Lego Mindstorms kit. And it was like the most expensive thing I'd ever received up till that point. Um, we were like, we weren't poor, but we weren't rich. Mm -hmm. So it was like a, it was a meaningful gift that way. Um, and I just started playing with it. And I started with like the kids there. Um, got to about middle school, uh, there was Science Olympiad. And I was always like, I think I always liked building, like I, I spent a lot of time with Legos and stuff like that. So I just liked building things and that helped build like my love for like just building things until like I would build things in my free time a lot. Um, but in terms of like how I got from like building things to like where I am now, I think there's two key experiences for me. One was my time on FIRST Robotics in high school. So um, our town didn't have a FIRST Robotics team. My good friend and I kind of pulled a group of people together and we were like, why don't we just go see if we can build a robot? So we did, and the team kind of grew, grew quite far after that. Um, what robotics taught me wasn't so much I think the math, the, uh, math side of engineering, we did no math whatsoever ever. And our first robot, um, the fun story of our first competition, first robot, there was one bolt holding the entire top of the robot onto the bottom of the robot. And we didn't, we hadn't realized, we hadn't learned about the concept of the lock nut at this point. <laughs> so it was just a jam nut that had been screwed on and like one hit, that bolt came out and the whole top of our robot ended up inside somebody else's <laughs> robot. And we got disqualified for that because we ripped out their entire electrical system. <laughs> but then somebody came over to us and was like, have you ever heard of a lock nut? And we were like, what's that? The 20, 20 high school students around their disassembled robot went, what's a lock nut? <laughs> um, none of us knew until someone, someone came over and pointed it out to us. Um, so I think that taught me how to like be really good with my, my hands and like building things. Um, and then what taught me even more is my uh, three years on solar car. Um, solar car is a is a time, definitely. But like, I think there's like Caroline Jordan, Salem, Ali, Kwong, Francis, all these people who are like older members on Solar Car, 
Lisa, like there's a whole, I can keep going, there's many of them. But like, these are the people who like, taught me how to channel how I want to build things and to how to build them well. They basically taught me everything I know about both electrical and mechanical design. That and like my mentor Elijah in lab right now has also taught me a lot about electrical design. So I think I spend a lot of time learning from other people and I also spend a lot of time on the side like if I have a crazy idea, I will just go to a makerspace and try it because worst case it doesn't work and I'm back where I started. There's no like harm. So I just spend a lot of time building things, I guess. That's my, that's my story. Mm -hmm. It's fair. Interesting that you also started on Mindstorms because that's how <laughs> I got mine too. Because like I, I literally for Christmas like one year, like we, uh, like I was like, I want to build stuff. And they're like, all right, but we can't give the kid an angle grinder or anything. So like, let's just get him like a tiny little Lego set. And like, that's, was you had like the little NXT, like the white brick, right? No, I will. It's funny you mentioned the angle grinder because that was my first tool. Oh. And the entire <laughs> robot. First? Was, that was my first tool. <laughs> Explains a lot. Um, besides <laughs> screwdriver and drill and normal house, my first actual tool was an angle grinder. Uh, we built a lot of robots with that angle grinder. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess actually pretty similar. Um, I like saw like a mind form stuff in like a catalog for whatever reason. Um, I was homeschooled for a bit growing up, and so like we get like these Lego education catalogs and whatnot, and they'd have like Mindstorm stuff in there, and I was like, oh okay, like this seems kind of cool. I want to I want to go build that. I want to make a thing that like drives around and like catches like red balls or whatnot. Um, so I, I got one of those, and then like my parents realized that it was a lot cheaper to like buy new books with stuff to make with that than it was to keep buying me more Legos. So there's like stuff on like how to make like Rubik's cube solvers and a bunch of like other weird stuff. Um, so I did that for a while and also didn't have like a ton of resources growing up. Um, didn't know like really any practicing like engineers or anything. I just had like, um, you know, a bunch of free time I didn't know what to do with. So I just ended up reading a lot of stuff. Um, and you can actually kind of see that like come out a little bit, like especially in DRs, like between the two of us. Like um, I spent a lot of time reading, so I have like a lot on like this side of the graph in terms of like principle and whatnot. But like a lot of times my intuition like nearly isn't quite as good as I want it to be because like I'll see something and be like, oh, I'm gonna go start analyzing this random part of this one thing when Addy will like rightfully tell me like, you don't need that, that's stupid. Um, and so like. And I don't have as much theoretical knowledge as he does, which is why we make a good pair. Yeah, like, like, the, we're like half a person, half a person. Between the two of us, there's like hopefully something resembling a competent engineer. Yeah. Um, but like, I, so I, I spent a lot of time reading, and then eventually, um, in high school, I um, I was like super broke then. I like had read like a bunch. Like, um, does anyone know the Art of Electronics by chance? It's a like gold book. It's basically like the handbook for EE. I had read that like cover to cover before I had ever touched an oscilloscope. Um, and so like I get around to high school, and then I eventually realized like, okay, all of EE right now to me is just symbols and math and whatnot, and I need a um, my like uncle owned an appliance parts store. I was like working there over the summer. I met somebody, and then like between like friends of friends of friends, eventually stumbled across this one um, like old like seventy something year old um, guy who basically had um, a bunch of free time. His kids had grown up and moved out, but he had like a big barn, which is full of a bunch of like tools and equipment and whatnot. Anyway, he and I became friends, and um, I like met him and then like you know carried a like 1975 hewlett packard like scope home with me later that day and i started like poking around and measuring a bunch of shit right because i'm like oh my god all the stuff that was like in in my textbooks i can like finally poke at right so then we became really really good friends um and like uh spent a lot of time just building random stuff in high school um i think the, i made uh, i eventually made a um like a kind of like reference clock that was used for synchronizing instruments. And um, between like some atomic clocks that he had lying around, because apparently that's a thing people keep in their barns, um, we were able to like do some math and figure out like, oh, okay, this thing, if you synchronize it to like the GPS timing network, like, okay, then it's better than an atomic clock. And I like, we made some cool stuff, right? Um, and so his name is Gene, and I owe a lot of like what I know to him um, in terms of just like how to build stuff in general and like what tools uh, you need for that and like where to go. Um, so 
that carried me a lot through high school. And then I got here and I joined race car like freshman year. Um, and I similarly have my own list of heroes like um, Rod, uh, Susie, um, Brandon, also Elijah, the same Elijah that's in his lab was formerly on race car. Um, they've all taught me a lot. And um, just have done a bunch of like random stupid projects like the, um, like the shopping cart that was motorized. That I, uh, I think I showed off like lecture two or something. Um, that was just like a dumb weekend project of like, oh, I want to put motors on a shopping cart and go really fast. And it was like one of the most fun things I've ever made. It took no time, very little like, um, very little like math was put into it. Like if it goes over a bump, like the rear, um, the rear frame tube just bends, like it keeps sagging, right? But like it was a lot of fun. And that was a thing that was built like primarily just on intuition and on vibes. Um, it's like terrible from a first principle standpoint, but it works. And it took me like $50 of random garbage I didn't already have lying around to build. And like that's one of the things I'm the proudest of building, not because it's good, not because it's like rigorous from first principles or like um, a textbook example of really anything other than being cheap and fun, um, but just something I built on intuition. And I think that that's like, that's kind of the, the place that we want to bring you closer to with this class is just like thinking like this, looking at a shopping cart and a pile of like crappy motors that you found on like Facebook marketplace and being like, yeah, I can make something out of that. Um, I don't know. That's kind of how I got my start. Um, yeah, about built a bunch of like random stuff along the way. Uh, a lot of that's on my website if you're curious, but like a lot of just like dorking around while I was at MIT bouncing between a bunch of different projects. Um, just whatever sounded interesting at the time. Satellites, quantum computers, race cars, just a bunch of things, just trying to like soak up as much as whatever sounds interesting. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that's like a reasonable-ish like explanation. Um, yeah. I also wanted to take some time today to go through the resources on the website. Yeah. The resources page, I don't know if, uh, briefly, now, I guess we could just briefly do that now, because like, because um, when people, People ask like, "How did you learn this thing?" We've thrown a link to it on the resource page. Like, quite, it's not like it is us dorking around, but mm -hmm. how we learn things is by dorking around. Yeah. So, it's dorking around with inspiration. Yeah, um, but there's just a couple of. I'll be brief on this. There's resources. Uh, there. Technical resources. Yeah, it's up there. This is up there. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So like. I'll be honest, in terms of the generally useful books, these are really good books. That doesn't mean we've read cover to cover every single, like, no. every single one of these books. Like, they're just, they're just, like, books that are, like, the Bibles of electrical engineering mm -hmm. that are over here. Like, electromagnetic, electromagnetic compatibility engineering is mm -hmm. a book that I wish I'd read. <laughs> I like, I wish I'd read before I designed anything, and now I will read it. It's my summer reading homework to myself this yeah. summer. Um, the other thing that, a book that I just love, not, I don't know how, I didn't read any of the text, I'm gonna be honest, I just looked at the pictures. So I don't no. actually know how, I can't speak, to, I've heard it's good, I, don't, I can't speak to how good it actually is from a knowledge standpoint, but like this Open Circuits by, I don't know who it's by. I think it's Evil Mad Scientist. I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's something like that, but basically what the, they did, they just sawed, they stuff, just in sawed stuff in half. Like they took diodes, sawed it in half. Wait, can we MOSFETs the, sawed it in half. Yeah, actually, place. they have some great pictures. Yeah, this is. These are just fascinating. Like, look, this is a PCB sawed in half. This is a. Um, this is an audio jack sawed in half. Uh, this is an audio jack in an audio port sawed in half. Mm -hmm. This is. There's some somewhere. There's an Intel processor sawed in half. Yeah. Um, Look at this, like this is cool. This is what this is what your IC package looks like. That's the chip, and the rest is just wires. Yeah. Um, there's some, there's a push button switch. What else is fun in here? There's a resistor, I think. That's a, no. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no that's a resistor, resistor. yeah. Um, oh, there's a transformer, that's cool. Oh, there's a, okay, this is cool. This is a transformer. That's what that looks like on the inside. But also, I think this is a, what is this? This is a Mag the magnetic head from a classic cassette tape recorder. Yeah. That's cool. Anyway, so the point is, the point is they just took a bunch of things and sawed it in half. And I had a field day looking through them. It yeah. was very fun. So um, 
if you're interested. I would totally check it out. Um, another thing is miters. Those of you who don't know about miters, especially if you're like electronics people, mm -hmm. this is a nerd fest of nerd fests. Basically, yeah. it's like a room in N51 where a whole bunch of people who like to build things dork around at 6 p.m. on Saturdays. Yeah. And there's two types of projects in miters. Projects where we've done a lot of math to figure out if it'll work or not, and projects that we have done no math at all. Mm -hmm. And there's no middle ground. Yeah. There's no half math. There's no. Yeah. It's pure intuition or somebody designed a motor driver. Things will either be like freshman wants to make like um, some electric scooter and get to like class really fast, and it's like okay, that's kind of like a cookie cutter thing. Like we can like you know weld some stuff together, find an old crappy frame, put it together. Or it's like the world's fastest Rubik's cube solver, which has like a bunch which of like cats. which is Ben cats, and like it's sitting up on the shelf over there. It's still there, but like you need math on that in order to solve the cube in. Uh, 600 milliseconds? Yeah, it's fast. Yeah. Um, it's fast. I don't know what the number is, but the latest project is called Doom Sled. <laughs> <Where <laughs> they've taken a, it's not a Prius motor, but it's a big motor. Mm -hmm. It's a very big motor. They have strapped it to uh, the old tire from the solar car trailer, a welded frame and skis. And they're gonna drive it across a frozen lake. Because I think miters is 90% not why, rather than why not. <laughs> so you just kind of, you know, but they're a great group of people to hang around because you just, you make so many stupid things, but you learn a lot doing it. Like it builds a lot of intuition on like, when it blows up, you mm -hmm. know exactly why. And helps, yeah. I think it helps you get better engineer in the future. It's, um, in the words of one of my housemates, it's where the smartest people you've ever met do the dumbest things you've ever seen. Um, that's that's why we like it so much. That's why we like it so much. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, these are a whole bunch of YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to talk about yeah. these. This was there's, mostly you. There's a, the, well, when I was young, I watched a lot of YouTube, and that's how I kind of like learned um, a, a fair bit. There's some cool channels in here. Um, a lot of them will do like specialized whatever. Um, Curious Mark has been like, he's an old uh, German dude who's been like repairing all the Apollo stuff and has been trying to make like a fully functional command module just from like stuff he's collecting. That's cool. Electro Boom sets himself on fire for like, um, with electrical whatever for YouTube Karma. Um, he's hilarious. There's a couple people in here that are like loosely MIT affiliated. Um, uh, stuff made here he used to work at Form Labs, like um, across in Somerville. And then Tanner Tech is actually, um, well, that's run well, by. He's still here. Yeah. yeah. It's it, uh, run by Tanner Packin, if you know him. You know um, Tanner, yeah. Yeah. Also, Ben Katz. Um, yeah, Ben Katz. Ben did, Katz is. Um, he got his PhD, or no, yeah, his master's. Master's. Like 20, master's in his, Song Bikin's lab here. He's responsible for the mini cheetah. He's responsible for. Um, the Rubik's Cube solver. Yep. He's responsible for a lot of things. One of one of his other recent projects is an, an espresso machine that he did some controls engineering on. Oh, yeah, I yeah. don't know what it was controlling, but it's like pressure and temperature. He did right? he did something like that, like a yeah. very precise espresso. Like the probably he'll probably have a Guinness World Record for the world's most precise espresso machine yep. or something. I don't know what. Yeah, he's nuts. He also hangs around here sometimes. He does, he comes by miters. He's uh, part of the reason why I wanted to come here, like in the first place. Like the write up for like the risk you can uh, mm -hmm. solve and whatnot. I was like, oh, I wanna go check these people out. Um, yeah, this kind of stuff, this PCB fab stuff, this is just like links to, you know, uh, places Very we get our stuff fabbed from. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the other the other thing that I, I think we didn't mention is like over here, if you go to the miters mm -hmm. website, this blog roll over here, honestly, amazing reads just like this is a whole bunch like basically most people in miters or a lot of them at least the ones who build the cooler stuff mm -hmm. um have like their own personal websites and on there they have a list of all the nuts things that they did to like learn engineering all the way back from like i don't even know what yeah. the first project was to like ben has his espresso machine and it's like um whatever and frankly some of these blogs like 
like Ben's blog, you're, you're talking about like thousands of people a month read, read this kind of stuff, because yeah. these are people who have been featured and like, they're MIT students who hang around Miters for a very long time learning to build things, and now they're featured in like, Charles Guan's blog is one of my favorites. Yeah, he's the uh, I plus one. He's, he, he's e to the I plus one dot net or something. Mm -hmm. And like, he built a shopping cart as well, but his had a very, very, very large motor on it mm -hmm. and could do a wheelie. Um, and it was featured in Wired. And I think Make, too. And I think Make. Like, yeah. wi both Wired and Make, his stuff was featured in. Um, I also pulled a lot of his math for when I was designing stuff for, like, um, my, like, Power Electronics final project. I was making a hoverboard yeah. that, like, you could just lean back and forth on, and he did that at one point. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just, like, yeah. pull some of that, too. Austin and Ben are huge motors people. Yep. Um, Uncle Shane is really good for FPGA stuff, actually. Like, if you want to see how to do, like, a thousand FPS like 4k video yeah. he will tell you yeah it's also it's like one of those things where it's like these blogs are great because they go all the way from like audio FPGAs like all that kind of electronics all the way to how do you make a Tesla coil like the Miter's Tesla coil is a pretty famous attraction I don't know how many people have seen it but like if you go to like the Rex party like during EC like uh, every year like the Tesla coil is over by the kitchen that you have to like unplug the two ovens in order to plug in the Tesla coil. Yeah. Like, it's that thing. Um, we run also, it until the power supply blows up. Yeah, it's also really funny because that building, that's just the funniest building in, on campus to me because on the first floor you have MITRE's solar car and FSAE. Yeah. And three floors above you have MIT environmental health and safety. Yeah. They're in the same building. <laughs> the same building. And then during CPW my year, MITRE's had their Tesla coil outside in the parking lot shooting lightning up at the <laughs> EHS building. Yeah. <laughs> Which is just, <laughs> just the iron, it's just such a fun place to be that yeah. nobody knows about. And honestly- Coffee shop is moving there too. So. Yeah. And also like, as we tell you about these resources, like it's, very few of these are going to meet you where you're at in terms of like where your current understanding of like electrical design knowledge is and intuition, right? <laughs> like people are writing these, like Ben Katz's um, espresso machine, like in there, it's gonna assume you have some knowledge of controls and whatnot. That's okay. There's um, like the way that we built our intuition was by like reading something that we thought was cool, figuring out what we didn't know, Googling around, and then just branching out, like and just Googling things that we didn't understand. Sometimes that led us to like just nonsense answers on the internet, but sometimes it actually helped us build some intuition. So like that process requires a lot of like time and effort. Um, and you know, that's, um, people at MIT will help guide you along with that, but fundamentally, at the end of the day, like you know, that self-guidedness is what's going to be the most productive. Yeah, and I think even more to your question of where we got started is like, I feel like knowing what you don't know and knowing what to Google are two of the most powerful things when learning to build things. More yeah. than even like, do I know how a capacitor works? Um, yeah, to some extent. But yeah. That's our, that's a spiel, we have many. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my McMaster order. Cool. <laughs> well, All right, we've got like um, 15 minutes or so left. Do you left. wanna do a little bit of the Bluetooth speaker in the sense of like what the parts are doing? Like is there one part of the Bluetooth speaker that people are like particularly confused? So I'll do like a three second diagram that you can get to detail. Yeah, I can also, which is, can I pull this back real quick? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the three second version of the Bluetooth speaker, right, is like, uh, for a speaker, I need to get audio in from somewhere. So, audio. I want like my banging Spotify playlist going through this thing. So I need something that has Bluetooth and will also control things like volume and will control things like, like and like send that Bluetooth signal that's coming in and create something that will go to the speaker, right? So that's my ESP. Mm -hmm. um, ESP32 is just a microcontroller. It's a very standard microcontroller they use that has, the reason people like it is because there's Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and all this other kind of stuff in built. And it's cheap um, and in stock. And it's cheap and in stock, that's a big one. So audio comes in, it goes to, I'm gonna call it thing one, which is taken Bluetooth audio, and that sends out, um, in here we do volume control, in here we do like signal processing and we send out 
audio as some sort of waveform. But most of the time, especially if you're using an ESP32, this is a digital system because most processors are digital based. So whatever it's sending out is audio, but in digital form. You following me so far? So I need to take this digital and I need something, thing two, that converts it into, actually I should draw this like this, analog. So there's a real question here on like, do I need this thing? Do I need to convert my digital into analog? Who knows the answer to this? Do I need to do this? Can I drive a speaker with a digital signal? Physically, can I? Can I put a digital signal into a speaker? I mean, I can, right? I can do whatever I want. It's a, it's a, it's a why I shove voltage in it, right? And it will do something, right? So I can, but oftentimes either the signal isn't powerful enough or for better audio, because sometimes you can put that digital signal in and because of the inertia of the speaker and like the fact that it's like, you know, it's a physical system. If I tell it move and don't move, it'll like have some time to accelerate and decelerate. And like maybe that signal will work for me because it's like, it's a physical system. There'll be some filtration in there. It has a mass, but that doesn't guarantee I'll have good audio quality. So to improve my audio quality, I'm gonna say I have an analog device let me make the signal as analog as possible. People following me there? Makes sense. So I have thing two, which converts it to an analog signal. Um, and this is my this is my DAC. This is my ESP. And then now my only problem with this analog signal is oftentimes digital signals. Like these, these chips, they're, they're, they're like designed for logic, right? They're designed to like take in inputs, process them, put outputs. They're not designed to like drive things at high power, right? I couldn't connect a motor to this and be like spin. So I'm gonna do it. This thinks, like it's like your brain, right? Your brain thinks, but it doesn't move your body. That's your muscle's job. You need like a power system that will like drive the things it needs to drive. So this is a small signal. And this digital analog converter is part, is kind of like, it's a logic chip. We just put one here because, uh, like it's also like a logic chip, right? It's taking logic in and then putting something out. So it also doesn't have the power to drive things. I need to create, make this signal the same waveform but powerful enough to drive my speaker because my speaker is big. The other thing this is helpful for is because, now I could design this to have the power to drive a speaker. But I have many different types of speakers. I have big speaker, I have small speaker, I have medium speaker. And if I want to drive many different types of speakers, I want a modular system like this because then I can change this component over here to drive different kinds of speakers, right? So I have, I'm gonna call this amp. So or thing three is the amplifier, which takes, literally takes this and makes it big. Same thing, but large. And this now has the power to, like it's quite literally, here's the sine wave in power, here's the sine wave in power, and it's just bigger. Same signal. Just so that I now have the energy required, and this is connected to my 12 volt power supply. This is connected to a three volt power supply. This is connected to a three volt power supply. So I need to create three volts somewhere, or it's five volt, uh, three. Sorry. whatever, sure. it's either three or five, some logic level voltage, and I need to create 12 volts. So that's where somewhere over here I will have power electronics that create three volts and 12 volts. But fundamentally it'll draw power from here and send it to my speaker. Now on the power side I have battery, and battery goes between, I don't know, uh, three, to 4.2 volts as I discharge it. Because if I discharge it, the voltage goes down. So I need something, thing one, creates three volts regulated. Because if I put a varying voltage here, chip's not gonna like that, one's three volts. How do I know that? It tells me in the data sheet. Over here, same thing. Over here, I need to create 12 volts. Um, so I'm gonna create 
I'm going to use the only thing that can create a larger DC voltage from a smaller DC voltage, and that's called a boost converter. Now there's other versions of power converters that create larger voltages from smaller voltages, but the fundamental, like the simplest one, is the boost converter. So I'm going to use a boost converter. And then I have a USB here to program this thing. And I also want to charge off of my USB. I need something that lets me charge. I need something that lets me talk to that. And that's everything in the Bluetooth speaker. Cool. We've got like five minutes or so left if you want like more detail on any of these parts. Yeah, and I can also like explain some of the like weird little bits in the schematic that we didn't that aren't covered by the block diagram here, if people would like. Um, there's, there's a couple like just weird things going on. Um, like we can just do this sheet by sheet real fast. Um, down here we've got a couple of circuits, um, each in their own blocks. Over here is, if I can learn how to use a trackpad, um, this is like an auto reset circuit because when we program the device, uh, we need to like Put it, we need to put it into like a programming mode and interrupt its normal operation. Um, so we do that by resetting the device. And this is called an auto reset circuit because um, our, when our USB chip will actually generate the reset signal for us if we configure it in the right way. Um, and so assuming you have the right drivers on your machine, um, it'll do that for you. And uh, this circuit basically just resets the chip so that it can turn back on inside of programming mode um, once it's done resetting. And then the thing that configures what mode it turns on in is um, this boot switch here. If you hold it, when you reset the microcontroller, it turns on in the programming mode, and then you upload code to it, and then you're good to go. Um, we also have the programming header here, which basically like breaks out the signals um, from, the, uh, like from the USB chip in the event that like we uh, can't use the USB chip. Um, this is this this is put into like this particular kind of header because um, they make these kind of chips called um, FTDI chips and they look a lot like this. Um, what it does is USB port on one side and then another USB UART converter and then this little header that you can plug into it. Um, this is an external programmer, so we can use one of these to program your uh, your board in the event that like the onboard thing doesn't work. Was our backup option, and for a couple of people, we're probably going to use it. Um, cool. So there's that. The power supply circuitry is basically like what we talked about. Um, like, there's nothing terribly crazy going on here. Um, like, we stole most of this circuit from the like data sheet for the part, and said like, okay, um, we want to set the output voltage. Okay, the ratio of these two resistors tells us that. Um, and there's also like a little bit of compensation over here that like changes how the boost converter responds to like a varying load on the output. Um, again, we took those numbers from the data sheet. There's not too much that happened here. Um, the same for like the battery charger that is like that wraps everything up into one chip. Um, we did change. We did program how much like current to charge the battery with, and that's what R6 does. But again, that's like one formula from the data sheet. Um, the interesting bits over here are like on the battery level sense, um, because we put a resistor divider in here coming off of battery voltage and then wired that to a pin on the microcontroller. And we did that because um, microcontroller can sense this voltage and then tell us what it is. And in doing so, that lets us monitor like the battery voltage and how much charge our Bluetooth speaker has. We can tell it to turn off the amplifier or shut itself down if there's too little battery voltage. Um, and so it gives us some safety that way. 
Cool. Uh, the DAC is basically like very similar. Most stuff is on the chip. We have a lot of bypass capacitors up here. Um, there's a little bit of circuitry out here with this resistor and capacitor on the um, right and left channel. That forms a tiny little filter to snub out any noise that the DAC is going to emit. Um, again, these values were picked such that they like don't, um, well, they were picked from, with defaults from the data sheet, but they were sized to not interfere with audio because we want to filter out any like high frequency stuff that we can't hear and keep everything below. So that's what this is. Um, on the USB side, there's really not that much going on here. This is just a USB connector. Um, but there's a lot of like external pins on here that we all connect to ground because the USB connector, like when you soldered it, has like all those little fingers that sit in the board, right? Um, we want the outside shroud of the connector to be just set to ground. Um, so that's what's happening here. And that also anchors it to the big ground plane on the bottom side of the board. So that it's like nice and firmly inside the board and it doesn't like get yanked out. Just uh, real quick on that. Yeah. Does anybody know why you want the shroud of the connector tied to ground specifically? Or why can't you just leave it plugged? Because I don't need to, like, it's, it's the casing of the connector, right? Why do I need to assign it to ground? Can't I just leave it? I don't need to connect it electrically to anything. Why did I tie it to ground? Briefly talked about it in like in the layout lecture. Today. Yeah. To minimize noise. No, it's not to minimize noise. It does minimize noise a little bit as like a byproduct. Kind of. It's not but, a primary reason. But yeah. like, if I go around in my socks on the carpet like this, what happens to me? And then I'm gonna go touch Jesse. It's not gonna work because Don't I don't socks. Don't do I'm that. Touch Jesse. Don't do that. <laughs> Didn't you guys do this to your friends in elementary school and you went like shocked them because it's really funny, right? Yeah, this is called electrostatic buildup and then the shock is called electrostatic discharge. So a lot of the time what will happen is like there, sometimes there are specific chips that protect against electrostatic discharge, but it's called ESD protection, which is kind of like, most of the stuff we design doesn't really have stuff like that because we kind of know who's interacting with it and we're very careful, right? But especially from a product design standpoint, if I'm doing product design, I don't know what your state of charge is when you come and plug my Bluetooth speaker into the wall. I don't really want your your fun sock game with your friend blowing up my electronics so you could like sue me that the speaker doesn't work now, right? Like I wanna, like you, you kind of need to protect against these cases when you're doing product design in real world. So tying that thing to ground helps with electrostatic discharge protection. And also you have like, cause then you've defined this is ground. So if you come here with your fun little charged finger and go over your, your connector housing it shocks to the connector housing that goes straight to your ground plane instead of going all through all of your electronics through the ground plane, which can, like, I mean, that's a high voltage. You, like, you're, you're talking about 30 kilovolts of voltage there. That's the electric, dielectric breakdown of air, right? That's a high, high voltage you shock straight through your board. You'll blow through all your electronics. So one way is to tie that housing to ground. The other way is to put a chip on there called an ESD protection. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, just to close out real quick, um, I know we're running a little over time with the amplifier. Um, basically, everything on the output over here by the um, like actual speaker terminals, that's the low pass filter that we talked about um, in the Bluetooth speaker lecture. That smooths out noise coming from the amplifier itself. There's some similar pins down here that do basically the same thing. Um, these little capacitor resistor um, arrays do that. Um, the stuff that's a little more like weird sits on the um, sits on the left side of the device. And if I, again, learn how to scroll. Um, there's a lot of like configuration pins here that we're setting. So like mod cell up here changes the, it, it lets you select the mode uh, that the chip is running in. Um, it has, if you look at the data sheet, it has a couple options for you. We pick the one that you get when you connect that pin to ground. So that pin is connected to ground. Um, there's also an SD pin here as well. That stands for shutdown. So that allows you to turn off the amplifier. Um, there's also a fault pin that tells you, um, that is like the amplifier's output that like lets it tell you when there's something going wrong. 
Um, notably, we didn't connect that to anything because we don't care. Um, and then there's the input for the audio coming off the DAC. We pass it through a capacitor um, because that um, AC couples the uh, input, which is what the DAC wants. And so we do that, and then there's a couple more options here for the power limit um, and the gain of the amp. So we can change how much power it's putting into the speaker by changing the voltage on um, this on this wire here. And if we go down, uh, you can see a resistor divider that's changing that voltage for us. Um, same with the gain over here. That changes the ratio between the input signal here and the output signal. So if we increase the gain, this will be larger. Um, that's um, if you have this amplifier on its own and you want like a volume knob, that's the pin that you go adjust. Um, everything else down here is like relatively, um, well, all does the same stuff. All the AM pins here change their, uh, what's called the amplitude modulation. Um, it basically, this thing switches so fast that it can interfere with AM radios. And so um, you can change what band of radios that you want to interfere with, depending on region. Um, if you're in the US, you'll want to interfere with one set of frequencies. If you're in Europe, you'll want to interfere with the second set because just the way that like the EU and the um, FCC have like partitioned off the airwaves there. Um, so we configure those with a set of resistors down here. And um, that's the reason why we asked you to remove R29, 30, and 31 on the boards is because um, we want all of these to be tied to 12 volts because that corresponds to the frequency bands we're looking for and um, not all the stuff on the bottom. Cool. That's basically everything I wanted to say about the speaker. Um, we're a little um, over wait, time. Last thing, yeah. just notice with this block diagram, just to make, just to be a little pedantic, we've blocked this into thing one, thing two, thing three that our circuit has to do. We designed it with schematic one, schematic two, schematic three that we had to do. Mm -hmm. And then we went to layout. I'm gonna lay this out over here. I'm gonna lay this out over here. I'm gonna yep. lay this out over here. And then I'm just gonna connect the blocks. You think of them individually and then you put them together at the very end. Um, that's the last thing I wanna say. Sweet. Um, cool, I think we're gonna call it here. Feel free to like come talk to us afterwards if you have more thoughts, opinions. Um, we'd love to hear from you and yeah, we'll do more, some more track 2DRs later tonight, and we'll see you next week.